All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to Cthulhu Drupal. We're going to code with some Lovecraft today. Appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, I know it's lunchtime, so good decision. <laughs> so I'd like to start off just real quick introducing ourselves. So uh, my name is Ryan Lose. I'm a web developer at Phase 2. Um, I'm relatively new to Drupal 8, and if any of you were at a DrupalCon last year, Phase 2 did a presentation about their internship program, and I'm one of those former interns. Yeah. And uh, I'm Toby Hagler. I'm Director of Engineering of our Product Delivery Group at Phase 2. Uh, I've been with the company for almost nine years. I've been doing Drupal for maybe more than a dozen. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I'm here to kind of impart some, some knowledge. All right. So how many of you have read some of Lovecraft, Lovecraft's short stories? All right. How many of you are at least familiar with his mythology? Okay, that's pretty good. So in short, the Lovecraft mythos is one where the universe is infinite and full of unknowable horrors that find the whole of mankind to be less than insignificant. Some of these cosmic entities, like Cthulhu, have found their way to Earth, and their eldritch truths have inspired cults, works of art, horrible crimes, insanity, and even the rise and fall of entire civilizations. Now, you're probably asking yourself, how does this strange mythology from the 20s and 30s have anything to do with Drupal? So, a common theme in cosmic horror, which is the genre of horror that Lovecraft inspired, uh, is this trope called blue and orange morality. And so, humans tend to see things in black and white, or maybe shades of gray, um, or if you're a little bit more complex, there's this sort of like X and Y axis of good versus evil on one axis, law versus chaos on another. But if you think of like a cat, right? Um, they're cute, they're cuddly, they love you because you feed them, uh, and they kind of sometimes like to murder things on sunny days. So their value system can't really be contained in, in our sort of like two-dimensional values grid, right? So strange and alien things like elder gods or cats, they see things with a completely new axis, right? It's the sort of like z-axis, um, and, and that's sometimes referred to as blue and orange morality. So this, this blue and orange spectrum, right? So Symphony and Drupal 8, they kind of exist like that. You know, people that, that are new to Drupal 8, um, you know, that, that have done Drupal in the past, it's hard. This is hard for them. People that, that come to, to Drupal from the Symphony world or from other object-oriented environments, it's easy. So we're not talking about easy or hard. It's just, it's just different, right? And so we accept this. And so in this session, we're going to strive to kind of understand some of Drupal 8's otherworldly ways. So show of hands, just real quick, how many of you would consider yourself relatively new to Drupal? M maybe, you know, less than two years? Yeah? Okay. And how many of you are experienced with previous versions of Drupal, but maybe new to Drupal 8? Ah, good. Yeah, this is the right crowd. Uh, so for those of you that are new, hopefully this is going to be, uh, you know, help you feel a little bit better adopting the insanity. Uh, for, for the veterans out there, you know, maybe this is going to help you teach Drupal 8 to uh, people who are new to it. So another reason we're drawing the comparison to Lovecraft is that if you work on Drupal's back end, then you might find the cycles of his stories oddly familiar. A lot of Lovecraft's protagonists start their stories by finding something unusual that is, on the surface, understandable by humans, like a statue or a diary or something, or in this case, a very straightforward looking UI. They then attempt to go a little bit deeper, learning that there's this entire complex world under the surface. But just looking at this world drives people to insanity as they struggle to comprehend its awesome power. A lot of Lovecraft protagonists, spoiler alert, end up either insane or dead. Um, but some will push through the madness to ward off the forces of darkness or even harness these powers for themselves. And as Drupal developers, we've all been through something like this, right? I mean, a big reason we are at DrupalCon is to improve our skills and understanding so that we can push through exactly this kind of thing a lot faster. So what we want to do here is teach you some of the back-end concepts of Drupal 8 and the relationship between them while couching it all in a metaphor that ties things together, expresses sympathy for how insane all this stuff can make you feel, and hopefully shows you the real power you have at your fingertips once you've mastered this system. Now, Toby and I have made a madness module that you can find right here that forms the backbone of the presentation and is the source of a lot of these examples. Feel free to download it for some more clarity on what's going on. 
Now there's one more thing we have to establish before we get started. So, you are the protagonist of one of H.P. Lovecraft's stories. A recent graduate of the Miskatonic University, you've returned to your hometown of Innsmouth to find that something's not right. Now Innsmouth has always been a sleepy kind of place where not a lot of good or bad really happens. But in, the years that, but in the years that you've been gone, things have changed. Folk have been disappearing, fighting each other, jabbering weird, arcane things. And you, an upstanding citizen, have decided that you're going to investigate and chart this madness that you've observed taking over. In your studies at the university, you heard rumors about this new tool called Drupal 8. You suspect that you could make use of a module to accomplish the, your task. First, you'll need to get a better understanding of what's going on of the insane utterings of your fellow townsfolk. Services, plugins, routes, controllers. As any sane scientific mind would do, you need to begin cataloging their behavior and make observations as to when their minds started to unravel. But, our, but your experience up until now has been with Drupal 7 or 6. Drupal 8 is so alien, so otherworldly. Where do we begin? So just to make sure we've got the, uh, the level set here, just a quick show of hands. How many are you familiar familiar with uh, classes in PHP, an object-oriented programming? Okay, cool. So I won't spend uh, a whole lot of time on these next couple of slides. I just kind of wanted to make sure we cover some bases for those that aren't. So uh, just for clarification, classes uh, are a custom user-defined data type. So you've got strings, integers, you know, enums, floats, uh, arrays, hashes, and that sort of thing. Classes are just another data type. Uh, however, classes are also made up of properties and methods. So if you think about how arrays have you know, different elements, uh, these elements can have different data types, including more arrays. Classes have properties. These are just variables within the class. Uh, they can also have methods, which is a special type of function um, that, that is contained solely within the scope of that one class. So you can't call a method directly like you would a function without first either calling the, the class statically or instantiating an object and then calling the method from that. The, the, the interesting thing, though, is that classes stack. So this is, this is a really key thing that you're going to see in a lot of uh, the design architecture behind Drupal 8 and in Symfony, classes stack. So classes can extend other classes. Uh, they take on traits from one class, make those traits its own, and then add more bits of functionality as they go along. So what is scarier than a spider? A giant spider. Right. Or, now, what if it has 100 legs? What if it becomes a shambling mound of 100-legged giant spiders? Right? They're all coming at you in the dark. So each one of these extends the previous class. So from a small eight-legged spider to a giant one to 100 legs, they just, you, know, you can keep extending this thing out until the, the fear and insanity kind of overwhelms you. And this is what's called class inheritance. So in, in Drupal 8, um, yeah. so, uh, so objects are essentially just going to be the uh, variable version of a class. So a class is a data type, an object is the variable. Um, you, can, you can call things like uh, node equals node create. You're calling a static class in this case. Well, that node variable then becomes an object. And you can access its methods through that arrow operator. So you can do things like node save. So does that kind of clarify for those that, that weren't familiar with classes and objects? OK. So one of the things that's changed in Drupal 8 is the introduction of Symfony. Uh, Symfony is a, is a very mature PHP framework. It's been around for a number of years. It's been around probably as long as Drupal. I forget the year, so forgive me. But uh, it's, it, was, it was added to, uh, to Drupal, and they uh, have, have worked very simpatico. Uh, but if you want to gain the benefits and powers granted by the Elder God Symphony, you first must submit to its design patterns. So much like the Elder Gods are wont to do, the very physics of Drupal have been uh, rewritten with a new underlying framework. So their, their acolytes have hailed this as getting off the island or proudly found elsewhere. Right? You may have heard these over the years. And yet, these non-Euclidean forces at work that quickly drive our citizens of Vinsmith mad without deeper understanding of symphony, object-oriented programming, or service-based architecture, plug-in-based design principles. So, so what about these changes do we really need to know? So 
Symphony aims to sort of wrestle the chaos and forge it into something a little bit more universal across platforms and frameworks. But in doing so, it introduces that, that blue and orange morality that we talked about a minute ago to a world that's used to black and white or shades of gray. So in Drupal 8, there's, there's now plugins, and there are service classes and other terrors that frighten even the most stale work developers or townsfolks. So what, what's worse that this you know, new type of code that doesn't even live in a dot module file? So you know, how in the nameless city are you even going to be able to find this code and execute it? So here's the lesson. So Drupal 7 and earlier, every single page load would load up all of the active dot module files. It stores it in active memory, right? You could have uh, a huge memory heap uh, that gets called every single time you, you hit a page. Uh, whether or not that code needs to get, you know, gets executed, there's, there's no way for Drupal to know, so it just loads everything. Uh, so if your site has 300 modules, think about how much wasted memory was getting allocated just to perform one simple task. Symphony grants special access to uh, what's called an autoloader uh, to Drupal. So that means it can build up a code cache of where everything is now and only load what's relevant for the particular page call, whether it's a page or a service endpoint. Uh, you know, it loads up you know, just the module it needs, it loads up just the plugin, just the services that, it, that are required. And this, this can result in an order of magnitude fewer resources being allocated to Drupal. However, everything comes with a catch, as we've learned in any Lovecraft story. To be granted these special powers, it requires that we enter into a pact with the Elder God, Symphony. So henceforth, we now must follow their design patterns with our code and our modules. So let's begin with namespaces. Uh, familiar with namespaces already or new, new concept? Yeah, okay. So a namespace is basically it's just an abstract container to hold the logical grouping of unique, yeah, I can't even say it, unique identifiers um, that we call names. It's very simple. Uh, an, ident an identifier defined in a namespace is associated only with that namespace. So just like the methods found in your, your class are limited to scope in your Tugger class, namespaces in PHP essentially limit the, the scope of your class to your module. Uh, a lot of times you, you'll see things if you're, if you're requiring things with Composer, everything is prefixed with a namespace. It's always Composer require Drupal slash panels, right? Drupal slash features, Drupal slash, it's, it's just a namespace. Uh, other projects could conceivably have a module with the same name, so we just namespace it with, with Drupal. It makes it unique. Drup uh, in, in Drupal, namespaces also tell Drupal where to find code. So this namespace declares that a Drupal module called Madness has at least one plugin. And one of these plugins has a plugin type called Block. And the class that defines our block is going to be named Top Madness, which lives in a PHP file of the same name. So you kind of see the file structure here. You see how namespaces are playing out. Uh, even things like uh, use statements, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, so so when you add a new module, Drupal scans that source directory that you see here, finds and categorizes all of your class files, and then it parses each one. The namespaces within each class, it tells Drupal, the, the Drupal autoloader where it is and how to find it. It's a, it's a way to call back to itself later. It's also a way to make everything unique. So in your class, as you need to reference other classes or objects, you'll use this use statement, which is it's using the namespace. So I want to use the user class that is defined in Drupal user entity user, following the namespace. The cool thing is if you did have another class in your module or in another module called user, you could use that one by specifying the namespace. So that's, that's one design pattern that you'll see pretty frequently coming from object-oriented programming in general, but in Symfony and now in Drupal 8. Uh, you also notice, by the way, that the directories and file names in under the source directory uh, use camel case. Uh, that's that's not me being sloppy. Uh, that's that's actually just a, a new sort of coding style that you'll see in Drupal. Um, however, you should still use lowercase if you're working in a dot module, if you're working with hooks. Uh, so yes, we do slightly mix styles in Drupal 8. It's maddening. So. 
Another design pattern uh, that, you, that you'll see are things like auto discovery of, of code uh, and annotations. And so in this code sample, uh, you know, all, only the important things uh, are very easy to read in your, in your code editor, right? Everything's all highlighted. The comments are kind of grayed out. However, the syntax highlighter is full of lies. It's lying to you. So this, this completely and utterly looks like a comment block in the middle of a regular code. So you see the at signs for IDE, self-documentation, but otherwise it just seems pretty innocuous, right? But just like the thing on the doorstep, there's something that lies asleep within us all, right? So when Drupal's autoloader scans your, your module directory, it sees this, and it, and it actually parses that particular block of comments out. Uh, so, uh, you know, when Drupal's autoloader scans modules, it can parse YAML files all day long, and it does this for a lot of uh, things like services, which we'll talk about later. However, because plugin classes are swappable, they're self-contained in a single file. You're not going to have a plugin, you know, spread out over multiple files like that. So it needs to have a, a sort of a way to be discovered by Drupal, and so that's what annotations are there for. Um, it's it's kind of like the final entry in a researcher's log. Uh, that you find in a cave just before he was swept off to some other place. It's a way for Drupal to kind of follow along with him. So each plugin type, whether it's a block, a form, uh, migration sources, data mappers, whatever, uh, these things all have different annotation blocks. So they have to have an annotation block, but they actually have different fields that are important. So you can actually go to api.drupal.org to look up how to instantiate a, a, a plugin. It's going to have a list of everything that is required or optional in an annotation. Another cool thing, real quick, I want to point out is, is the use of the at translation uh, directive. Um, that's very cool because if you have stuff that's going to be user facing or even admin facing, uh, a lot of your strings can be translatable directly from the annotation. So, Symphony, plugins, services, these words all feel inhuman and strange as they pass through your lips. And now, you're beginning to under, now that you're beginning to understand these alien terms, it's time to talk to the villagers whose rantings and ravings suddenly sound a little more coherent. It occurs to you that speaking to mad entities in a mad tongue might drive you mad yourself. You decide to put that out of your mind. So speaking of entities, Nodes, users, media items, these are all entities in Drupal 8. So in, in Drupal, um, you know, in terms of inheritance, for instance, a Drupal user is an object of the user class, which extends the entity base class. Drupal also adds the concept of fieldable entities, uh, which grants other entity types the privilege of having fields. So you know, in, in, in previous versions of Drupal, only nodes had fields um, you know, Drupal 6 and 7, you know, uh, only nodes had fields, whereas, um, you know, so now, um, you know, you're able to add a new field to any entity that is a content entity uh, in Drupal. It doesn't matter. Uh, I will say that if you, uh, you can share fields between uh, different entity types of the same entity, so uh, content types within nodes can share fields. However, those fields can't be used on user objects, on taxonomy objects, and so on. So there is a sort of limit there. Uh, so in the example module that we use, the madness module, um, we wanted to add a madness level field to the user object to keep track of everyone's level of insanity. Um, there's a lot of ways to provide that sort of functionality in a module. We're going to do it the easy way. We're going to do it the moral way. Uh, so uh, very simply, a lot of this can be done through the UI initially. So you can create a new field. You go to uh, admin, configuration, account settings, manage fields. Uh, then you can click on the manage fields tab. You add the field to create, you know, you, you click add field to create a new field, obviously. Uh, and, and so for the, for the madness module, we actually created um, a numeric list, just a scale of one to 10 to figure out how mad a particular user is. Um, and then the next step, of course, is you want to be able to export that field as configuration that you want to add to your module. So you, you can start by going to the admin section again, configuration, config, sync. Uh, this is all just part of core. Uh, and then click the export tab. Uh, and you choose the configuration type that you want. In, in the first case, we choose field. In this, uh, in this screenshot, we choose field. 
Uh, and then you choose the configuration type madness level. And you copy and paste that text somewhere in your, in your editor. Uh, but you also want to pay attention to the dependencies because you want to be able to capture all of those others as well. So in the case of uh, a field, you also want to capture the field storage. <clears throat> Uh, you may also need to, you know, if you're, if you're using this method, that, because there are other methods that are easier as you become more familiar with it, uh, but in this particular case, you do want to maybe edit the configuration uh, slightly and remove UUID and underscore core items from this, uh, from this YAML. However, the configuration that it gets exported is just YAML uh, like everything else. Uh, it's important to put your configurations in the right place. Uh, if you do, then your... Configuration is going to get automatically added to Drupal the moment you uh, enable the module, and then it's going to get ignored from here on out. It's kind of nice. Uh, that means you can then edit the fields that this module uh, enables uh, through the UI like normal. Uh, but you put your config files in the right directory structure, and then when the, when the module's enabled, uh, it, you know, that config's automatically imported uh, one time, and then that's it. Uh, then you can edit the YAML config, by the way, um, so, for instance, we decided to remove that pesky field underscore uh, that appears before every user-defined field. So the, our field name is actually just madness underscore level. Now, that's not a requirement. It was just a sort of way to sort of demonstrate that you can manipulate uh, some of the inner workings of the configuration. Um, also, you may want to, if you do use this method, and you enable that module, you want to be able to remove the field manually uh, from, your, from your config before you enable the modules. Uh, then Drupal might complain that it's a, a, a duplicate field. This is just one of several ways to, uh, to create config in your new module. Uh, it's not the only way, it's just a quick and dirty way to do it if you're doing something simple. So here we have it. We've got a newly added field on the user profile page that is available as soon as the module is enabled. <coughs> So now that we have a, a field on the user object, that's cool, right? We can start, we can start cataloging the insanity of users in, in, in Innsmouth. Uh, we can start comparing users to others. It, it would be nice, though, if we had a block that could just kind of list the mad users. So if we want to do a block, we need to learn about plugins. Now that you have a better understanding of the dark powers at work, you decide that you need some way of tracking the madness in town. You try to find some way to represent the madness, but there's just too much data and it's ever shifting. The hooks that you came to rely on in the past won't provide the power you need. And you're about to give up on this seemingly impossible task, but it occurs to you that maybe you could harness the Dark One's power for yourself. You recall the plugin functionality from your earlier research and realize it would be the perfect way to chart this data. You're only going to use a small fraction of the power before you. What could possibly go wrong? All right, so another important part of the Madness module is the Madness Levels block, which we have right up here. It uses Drupal's plugin system, which is a really important backend concept, to show how mad the various people in town have gone. And this is just one example of what can be done with plugins. So in a broad sense, plugins are a specialized kind of class that provides a, a single unit of functionality that solves one problem and is swappable. Some parts of Drupal core, like blocks, fields, forms, etc., have been designed to be pluggable so that you can reach in and change them if necessary. Plugins always have a plugin type, which is the central controlling class that extends and, and defines how the plugin is discovered as an, and instantiated. These are the most common plugin types, but you can, of course, create your own. A really helpful way to think about plugins is that they're very similar in functionality to hooks. But if the right hook isn't the right hook isn't always available, and they, there aren't always hooks that will do exactly what you need it to do. So in that case, write up a plugin to get that thing done. So for instance, a while ago, I ran into a, a situation where I needed to filter the results of a view based on data that I was getting from a contrib module, and there was no default Drupal filter that would do that for me, so I had to write up my own filter plugin to get the job done. So earlier we talked about the various requirements for plugins to work, and here are some examples of them in action. First, we've got the namespace, um, which just shows both you and Drupal the exact path for this plugin, which is just Drupal slash madness slash plugin slash block. Then we've got the use statement, which tells Drupal which class you want to use by calling on that class's namespace. And this class, by the way, has a bunch of other use statements. We just have this one as the example. And then there's the annotation, which again is 
is code. It's not a comment. I have, trust me, I have made that mistake myself. Um, this annotation just registers it with Symphony as the top madness block and that it can, that it can be found in the madness category. Finally, we have the declar declaration at the bottom, which declares that it's going to be called the top madness plugin, and it's going to extend the block base class, and it's going to implement the block plugin interface. As for the content of the class itself, it starts by setting two protected variables, one for the number of users to show, and one to decide whether or not to link those users, uh, or to link that, that to the page of the individual users. This is basically just setting defaults that we're going to use later on in the logic of the actual code. It then implements three methods, and you can look at the module yourself to see the actual logic that's going on between them. But a rough summary is we've got the build method, which is required for any use of, of the block plugin. Then you've got the block form method, which alters the default form. And then you have the block submit method, which allows you to run block specific submit handlers. Also, if you were to go into the block plugin interface, you would see all three of these methods and a bunch of other ones that you could potentially pull in if you needed them. You're starting to get it now. You see the old ones influence all over town. You can feel the power coursing through the plugin you just created. It occurs to you that this power must be emanating from somewhere. You find certain routes in town have become unusually well-traveled of late, and you decide to follow them for yourself. So we've just seen how to create configuration for a specific block, but what if we want to have configuration for our entire module? So let's take a look real quick at how to create a configuration admin page. Uh, this is also the same method you would use to create almost any other page. So long gone are the days of hook menu uh, and callback functions. Um, paths and URLs to content, they've been all replaced with Symfony's introduction, you know, the, the Symfony framework of uh, routes and controllers. So routes can be thought of as the path to a page, but it's a little bit more abstract than that. It's not necessarily just a path to a page. It's not necessarily even uh, one particular piece of content. It's, it's, uh, it's just sort of an abstract thing of you're going to request something. And that's, that's the, the route is the, the sort of thing, it's the switch box that routes that request. And so that, that route oftentimes will give the request to a controller. And a controller is just another type of class. And so they're just special classes that handle the response to the request. Uh, they, they control the content, they control the message. So uh, looking at how to define a route. So you, in your module, have the module name dot route uh, routing.yaml. Um, so it's important again to reiterate that routes are not paths. Um, now routes do provide ways for users to get to your content, and sometimes that's a page, sometimes that's an API endpoint. Uh, the important thing is that you just define a route to content or data, and then a controller handles the response. Uh, it's just a traffic cop, basically. Uh, how, that's, that's kind of how routes can, can link to anything. So, the first key uh, of, of this YAML file, uh, of course, is, is the route name itself. So madness.settings.form. Again, we're using a very common design pattern of namespacing everything with our module. So the route can be any string. It doesn't have to have that dot. However, it's a design pattern to have the module name, dot, and then some internal route thing. So uh, it's, and it's important to know that route name later uh, because Drupal no longer uses paths directly. Uh, you know, used to, you know, if you made a link, it was always like L, the L function, and then the, the actual string. In this case, you're actually always going to use, um, use the route name. Uh, then the path, you do define the path as part of the route. The path is just the thing, the, it's just one way uh, for, the, for the request to come in. Um, so it can take tokens, uh, just like Hook Menu did uh, in previous versions of Drupal. Uh, and the token, you know, it passes that value uh, from the path onto the controller if necessary. Uh, defaults is just another uh, bit of configuration that you can have. Uh, just, you know, it's where you define the basic information about the response. You know, things like title uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and anything here um, is going to get automatically translated, which is pretty handy. Uh, in this particular example, we use underscore form so that we can use a form plugin because forms in Drupal now are, are plugins. Uh, we're going to use that as the controller. Um, however, if you were not to use a form plugin, you could specify a controller just like in the, the second code sample here. 
but when you do that, when you actually specify a controller, you actually have to give it the full namespace to the class as well as which method you want to be the, to handle the response. Uh, one controller could have you know, dozens or however many uh, methods that you want. Um, there are some other things uh, that are handy to note, uh, like requirements of the route. Uh, this is where you would define permissions. Uh, things like options, you can, you can tell it, hey, this is an admin page, do some of your special Drupal magic to maybe not let people just willy-nilly find the route. Um, and, and, and kind of a quick aside, since we're dealing with routes and controllers and paths and menu things, uh, you can also define menu links directly in your module. Uh, in this case, it's module.links.menu.yaml. Uh, and what this does is it, it establishes a link item uh, to appear somewhere in Drupal. So to, so to make things easier, we created this for the module as well. Uh, this automatically just adds a menu link somewhere. So we start with adding the route name, which I said, you know, you're going to use the route name uh, over and over again now. Um, and, and, and so this is just one case of where you use the route name instead of a path. So the title again is self-explanatory. Uh, then the parent is the route name of the parent menu link. So adding, adding this particular optional um, element here uh, means that our menu link is going to be a submenu of the people group of the admin page, which the admin page, it's, it's just a really big fancy menu. So uh, we talked about routes, but um, routes can hand things off to controllers. So here's a sample of a controller class. Uh, it does use the namespace of Drupal, your module name, and controller. Uh, you'll remember in some of the namespaces, they get a little bit more defined, like Drupal, module name, plugin, plugin type, and then the class name. Uh, but since controllers don't really extend anything, they're not, they're, they're, they don't go that deep. Uh, so it does use the namespace. Uh, it doesn't have any default methods, so that's why you have to specify the method you want to use in the route. Um, but this is all just kind of default behavior that comes from Symfony that's, you know, established in the Symfony framework. Routes and controllers are a very common design pattern in a lot of frameworks. After all this investigating and the near madness of its complexity, you start to realize what you've discovered. This is no mortal power you're dealing with. Entities, plugins, routes, you cackle with glee as you channel the old one's power into your own creations. And yet, you sense there's still something missing. You keep seeing this word service appear, and you don't know what it does. You only catch it in passing, and each time you do, it leaves you shaken and doubtful. Maybe man was not meant to reach this far. Maybe you've reached the limits of your comprehension of the old one's power. No, you're in far too deep to turn back now. So one of the several design patterns that Symfony introduces, of course, is service-oriented architecture. So if you can imagine for a moment a warren, a tiny little creatures running around doing something for a master entity. Each one has their own task that they perform, and that's all they do. And sometimes they actually have to work together to accomplish tasks. And so this is essentially how you can visualize service-oriented architecture. Just a very common design pattern that is uh, now part of Drupal 8. So as we said before, a service, it's just a class. Uh, it's just a fancy name for, for a fancy class. Specifically, it's a class that's intended to do something. Uh, so services are often, you can think of as verbs uh, in, your, in your module. Unlike a plugin, there may be multiple levels to the service in order to, to perform its task. Now, another scary concept of services, and, and you can almost go to an entire session about this, is the concept of dependency injection. Is anybody familiar with dependency injection? You're all feeling okay? Yeah, 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 hands only go up about this high when we say yes to, to dependency injection, that's cool. Um, so, you know, like the name suggests, you're injecting whatever dependencies you need for that service directly into it. Uh, so, in this particular design pattern, it's meant, it's meant that your service class doesn't, you know, it can operate independently without having to go and fetch anything. It doesn't have to know anything. It just, it's doing a thing, that's it. And it has everything it needs in its little bundle of injected dependencies. So, 
you know, so, you, so, so this pattern sometimes is, is referred to as separation of concerns. Uh, it's not concerned with um, how something gets logged. It just needs to log something. So it says, hey, you've already injected the logger dependency, the logger service as a dependency into my service. I'm just going to log something with whatever you pass. I don't care. If it needs to make a database connection, a database connection is a service that can be injected into your service, and it just, you know, uses that. It doesn't have to go and fetch config settings or anything special. So that's how you're able to kind of separate the concerns from one service from another. Um, <clears throat> so when, when Drupal's autoloader then, of course, comes along and discovers all of these service classes, it puts it in what's called the service container, which I think is kind of, kind of spooky in itself. So the service container actually is just another Drupal service, uh, but it's basically just a fancy index of all of the services that Drupal knows about. It's, it's almost like a, just a big array with some metadata. Um, you know, so it, it knows about all of the services that Drupal knows about, plus whatever dependencies they need. So there are also other types of services, just like blocks have, uh, plugins have plugin types, which are things like blocks and forms and field widgets. Um, services also sometimes have types. Um, and again, this is not a code thing, it's just a design pattern, but events are one type of service uh, that you'll run into. So events are, uh, you know, they're, they're just a regular service, but they get called automatically by Drupal at particular points of code execution. They're not something that you call um, out into the dark like you would a, a regular service. Uh, they, they can get triggered at certain times. Uh, so one event might be an incoming HTTP request is received, or a response has been generated, or that response has just been delivered. Uh, so you can have events that do some garbage collection or uh, cool things like that. Um, also, when you describe, in a, when, you, when, you, when you're working with events, you can actually create an event subscriber, uh, which is a thing that just says, hey, I'm listening to whatever event is going to get called out. I'm waiting for my orders from, the, from my uh, Symphony Overlords. Uh, and, then, and then that gets executed in just a priority order. So one of the things about services, of course, just like plugins that have annotations, services have uh, services YAML file, which you know is is it's what uh, it's what Drupal uses for the discovery method. So in your module, you have my module services YAML uh, that defines all the services that your module needs. Uh, each service, of course, is going to have a service ID. Um, so in this case, we have madness .event subscriber is one, and then madness .levels uh, is another service. So once you tell Drupal that a service exists, um, you know, you give it the namespace of your class. Uh, so if Drupal knows about that namespace, it'll know where that class is and so on. Uh, you can also tell Drupal a little bit more information about the service uh, tags. Uh, tags is something that's, that's essentially how you tell it what type of service that is. So in this case, we've created a, an event subscriber. So uh, later on, if you go download the module and play with it, uh, there's an event uh, so that any time a page is loaded, there's a sanity check that's executed, and then if, uh, if, if random users uh, fail their sanity check, their, their madness level is in incremented by one automatically. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's all, that, all that does is tell Drupal that that particular service class is, is an event subscriber. Um, and then you also notice uh, that that particular event subscriber takes arguments, event dispatcher and logger factory, because we want to, you know, we want to say, hey, I'm listening to an event. I also kind of want to record the fact that somehow somebody might have been driven a little bit more mad. Uh, so those are examples of, of dependency injection. We're injecting two services directly into our event service. Now, once Drupal sees the service YAML file, all the services found therein are added to the service container, which, you know, like, like we said, is just a special data structure within Drupal that houses all the information for every service. So that is sort of like a tome of ancient lore. So services may be forgotten over time because they're not used frequently, but they are recorded in the annals of the service container. They're just kind of waiting for the day that they should be summoned forth and awakened to the daylight. So in this particular code example, 
uh, we see the start of the Madness level service class. So as you can see, it's just like any other class. It, it doesn't actually extend anything. It's a very simple service. Um, and so, so it's very simple in a lot of ways. So it sets a namespace for itself, uh, and it also has some protected properties for internal use only. Because services can kind of keep secrets to themselves. Um, uh, they, don't, they don't want other services to know what they're up to. Um, you also notice that this, uh, this get users method um, is using the entity query method from the static Drupal class. So that's actually one way that you can, you can call um, another static class. The Drupal slash Drupal is just an object that's floating around in Drupal. Uh, that's, that's, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's not actually an object. That's actually just a static class. Um, and it's slash Drupal, so we don't even have to define a use statement because you don't have to define a use statement to list every class. It's, it's a good, good practice, so don't listen to me. But you can say slash Drupal, colon, colon, entity query, and you can call that, that method directly and statically. Um, also, a quick side note, I did say that uh, services like to keep secrets sometimes, uh, as all good creatures of the night do. Um, so you, you actually have the concept of privacy uh, with object-oriented programming. Uh, so, so if something is declared as public, it can be called anywhere outside of the class. So for instance, that entity query is a public method. Uh, private means that it can, it can be called by the containing class. Uh, private properties or methods, they can't be accessed outside of the class. Um, and then of course protected means it can be called only from within the current class or any children of that class. So uh, if, if, you, if you want things that extend your class to not be able to use those properties or other methods, uh, you can actually mark it as private. So let's talk about invoking a service. I showed you how to invoke a, a, a static method. So here we can invoke a service. Uh, so now in the, in the madness level block, uh, this, is, this is part of that build method that Ryan showed us a minute ago we can simply request users from the madness level service. We, we invoke it using the Drupal classes service method. Uh, this looks up the madness levels uh, in the service container uh, and executes the get users method for us. Um, so you know, then we can pass things like the user count variable, which was the configuration that we said in our block, because we, we had those other two methods that actually handled form uh, submission for configuration options for the block. Um, and so then we can pass that as part of the creation of the service or the instantiation of this service. So that, that user's variable is just getting the return from, from that particular service. Um, so yeah, so the, the user count variable is in fact a block level configuration, uh, which you can see being said in the screenshot here. Um, so you can you choose how many, uh, how many users you want to be able to see at one time in that block. Uh, and then since we're using a service to fetch the users, we can easily change this at the block level, and the service doesn't care. It just knows, hey, you instantiate me with however many users you want, that's how many you get. At last, not only have you traced the source of the madness in your town, you've harnessed its power for your very own, and now you wield it with impunity. But you're never completely safe. You never know when a new module or new functionality might distort your understanding and send you stumbling to the madhouse. You need tools, spells with which to shape and tame your unholy creations. You need a Necronomicon. So here are some of the things that we found particularly helpful when developing Drupal's backend. Now, obviously, your Necronomicon should include basic things like Stack Overflow and Google and mentors. Um, but here are some of the things that we found or, or that we wanted to focus on. And by the way, each of these could probably occupy an entire talk on their own. So at the end of this slide, or at the, or at the end of this presentation, we have links to a bunch of tutorials for these. So imagine if you had the power to manipulate time itself. Pause it, move forward at your own pace, look backwards through it. Surely such a power would drive mere mortals insane. Well, Xdebug is that power. Like all debuggers, it lets you stop a function at any point so you can look at what the variables are doing at exactly that point, which is especially useful in Drupal when you're dealing with enormous objects like the form object on screen there. It lets you sift through it and um, run methods on properties 
for those objects that you do, so that you don't have to test it by writing it out and refreshing the page over and over again. You can jump forward in time by st skipping over or stepping through various functions, and you can even move backwards in time by going to the, through the stack trace that's also up on the screen. And you've also got your CLIs. They allow you to communicate directly with and invoke the great old one's power without using the slow visual interface that most mortals rely on. Drush is something that is, is absolutely essential. It saves you a bunch of different, a bunch of clicks and allows you to do simple repetitive tasks really easily like clearing the cache, pulling up your reports, and um, installing modules. And then there's also the Drupal console which can do a lot of the same things that Drush does, but it also lets you generate boilerplate code for modules, plugins, entities, field widgets, any of that stuff. And it can import and export config files. There's, there's a lot of things that, Drush, or that Drupal console can do. So you know that the world of the UI is largely an illusion. It takes the data that's too complex for human com comprehension and presents it in the way that's pleasing to the eye. But sometimes you need to see that raw data. And that's where SQL Pro comes in. SQL Pro is great because it gives you a nice visual interface for your database. And if you're doing backend development, you're probably going to have to do this at least once. It allows you to double check if your information is actually there, check where it's stored, and you can even run queries directly in SQL Pro, uh, SQL Pro to see if the queries that you're creating are actually pulling out what you need. So you're now fully versed in the ancient powers lying just beyond human perception. But to get the most out of those powers, sometimes you have to pull them up to the surface. And Devel is your spell to merge the worlds of the UI and the back end together. The information you gain through this can be kind of overwhelming, but it's super helpful. Essentially what Devel does is it takes a series of modules that are for developers and makes the UI a lot clearer and it gives you a bunch of extra information. For instance, it has Kint in it, which takes your basic var dump or print r function and spits it out in a much more readable, user-friendly way. You've also got the web profiler, which adds a toolbar to the bottom of your screen that gives you helpful information like the route you're currently on or whatever queries are being run or the blocks that are on the page. It also allows you to generate and fill in dummy content like nodes and users in case you want to have actual data to work with. The final spell we'll recommend for your Necronomicon is what I like to call the, the magic was inside you all along spell. In other words, Drupal itself is really good for learning about understanding and implementing Drupal. It's got a lot of built-in utility functions to help you do things like parse HTML, convert Unicode, manipulate arrays. Um, the core.services.yaml file will list all of, the, all of the services in core that we were talking about earlier. The um, api.drupal.org is a great reference for how all the APIs work together. All of the core classes, hooks, methods, and properties are very well documented. And my personal favorite is just using Drupal itself to figure out what you want to do. So if you, say, have a method that you want to invoke and you're having trouble figuring out how to make it work, just control F, find it in Drupal core, throw your debugger on it, and just run through and see what, what specifically it's doing. And with that, you come to the end of your journey. Despite the odds, you've not only survived your Lovecraftian adventure, you've come out more powerful than before. This path you've chosen will push you to madness many more times as you wrestle with Drupal 8's immense complexities. However, you now know how to face it head on, and that a little madness ain't actually that bad. We've actually got a few minutes left. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, if there's anything that we covered that we went through fa too fast for, uh, or, or just thoughts in general. Yeah, sounds like maybe we covered everything well. <laughs> Everyone fully understands it now, right? 100%. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, if you do, if you do wind up with questions later, uh, Ryan and I are going to be in the phase two booth at 205. So yeah, feel free to come by and, and check it out. Um, we, we can talk more. Um, also, uh, like Ryan mentioned earlier, we're going to put these slides up here uh, this afternoon on the DrupalCon session page. Uh, so you'll be able to, to flip through the, uh, the, the PDF of the slides 
Uh, there are some pretty good resources at the end uh, that you'll be able to link back to uh, and also download the Madness module and play with it yourself. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you. coming out. Hey. Oh, I, yeah. Arkham Horror, Arkham Horror Box. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. Hey. Yeah. So, so that's, that's always kind of a grab bag, right? Um, one of the first things that I recommend doing is there's a what? module called uh, Module Upgrader. Uh, they're already and, uh, I, oh. you know, you know, I don't know if you know Angie Byron, um, web chick. She, uh, she wrote that. Um, and of course, there's other contributors as well. But um, it is a module that has a bunch of brush commands and I think maybe uh, Drupal Console awesome. as well. But anyway, it, it yeah, we figured it would be a good automatic thing to pull people Drupal in. Seven module and do a lot of the conversion to things that it knows about to Drupal 8. You have to be very careful because it's automated code. Um, and so it kind of requires that the code is you know, formatted correctly. It requires that it's following certain patterns. Uh, but things like uh, a lot of your hooks. Yep. You can never unlearn that. <laughs> um, and so you can, you can use that um, maybe on um, some of the, the ones that are No, like but we're going to put them up later in the afternoon. Degree. So they'll be you just on the page for the... And it gets you about 80% of the way through. It, it doesn't ever do a complete module because there's a lot of custom code, yeah. but it will at least put a lot of the patterns so that were in Drupal 7 and convert so really patterns to Drupal 8. Uh, and that'll get you a lot of the way there. Yeah. And so then you can kind of come along and, you know, Random customer request. How are you supposed to know? So the way, unless usually what happens is I, I use my my variables and my mm -hmm. and so script, mm -hmm. and then like I, I save it and see what it, happens. It, it could it could oh. potentially break, right? Do you so, use an ID? Uh, so what it what it does? Is it will it will because those make your life so much easier. So I, I use PHP Storm for instance, uh, and, then at least and a lot of the time right it all. Uh, now some of it it will yeah. come in out. Um, um, well, you know, so a lot of the time what I'll do is, is if I'm writing in, as it is. if I'm so pulling in kind of some other class, parse through it. then but, but you can either like make a note of what you yeah. pulled in and just write yeah. it in, or so in to, a lot of, in PHP Storm specifically, um, you can, there's a, I think it's like command B or something that will just say, hey, import the class that I need, uh, or import the it, use it statement that I need to make sure this class actually works. That kind of thing is super helpful, I guess. Yeah, like I said, the, and, and the, way the tools, um, especially PHP um, Storm, are really, really great. Everything that's going to be in the source directory or one of the config directories. So anything that it was able to successfully move, it'll be in one of those directories. And so anything that's left in your .module or .api, .php, you know, any of those files, any of those files, uh, we'll kind of leave those in there. So, so right. you know, like, it's a smaller subset well, of so it's you just know, like a regular uh, yeah. var print but yeah, the, the, the module var dump kind of thing. And that, is a, is so really say, place to say you're going to print out a form element, right, and you just want to yeah. get yeah, the specific part of it. You don't have to say, like, print just okay, the form you. variable because that gives you everything. You can narrow it down to, like, form and then, um, I don't know, title or whichever, you know, whatever's further down in the array. You can just yeah. narrow it to just those yeah, exact things. But I think you can narrow it down so you don't need to figure out uh, man, I got three. So I would use, uh, honestly, I tend to use Xdebug more than yeah. developer Under, kind of purpose more. because you yeah. can just, you throw the breakpoint in and then it just, it gives you this nice <laughs> UI in, yeah. uh, in PHP Storm of yeah, just all yeah, the yeah. arrays yeah, and everything. I'm you can just open them there and yeah. it runs super fast and it's, it's great. And you can narrow it down. You can use yeah, it's super helpful. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm terrible yeah. at bullet on the festive days, and so, you know, last night was more no, of a... No, 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 they're still there. Nope, um, they're still don't have it. Not all of them, but, but uh, like, hooks are, st are still, like, a, a very <laughs> that, that important that thing. Nice. It's just that's, that a lot of functionality has been removed over the plugins specifically. And, and like I said in the presentation, yeah. if you find, like, yeah. Yeah. If you're going through there the list of hooks on D.O and there's something that they don't do what you need it to, you can probably find a plugin, or you can probably rewrite a plugin in a way that'll yeah. accomplish what you need. Um, yeah. I'm really good. Yeah. Great job. Hey. Is there any? What's the easiest way to access your magic? 
Hi, man. That was a great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about that a bit. It's so. It, it's it Drupal's good one. Basically, it varies from project to project um, because there's so many different things that it uses that Seven doesn't. Um, Toby might be better at answering well, this. I'm sorry. What was the question? It was just like you know with the security update. Mm-hmm. Well, are you looking to go from seven to a later version of seven? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So, with, with the most recent security updates, um, they were released as patches. So, you can actually apply just the security update um, without necessarily having to upgrade the entire CMS. Um, so, you can you can go apply the patch, and there's there's you know if you if you search for applying patches on Drupal.org, it'll actually show you the commands to apply it, and so. Um, but you can you can apply just the patch now if if you. Oh yeah, you, you definitely should because while while the sort of like, you know, they call it like Drupal getting two, um, you know while that patch is related it is is able to be patched. You may actually be vulnerable with other things, right? 